nonfiction finalist Deborah Baker, The Convert, A Tale of Exile and Extremism, published by Grey Wolf Press. The Convert is the story of a woman born in 1934 in a New York City suburb who at the age of 27 became a Muslim. In 1962, at the invitation of Pakistan's most powerful Islamic leader, she left New York to live in Lahore, where she became the voice of Islam's argument with the West. She never returned to America. Like many children, I was once haunted by big questions. Where did I come from? What is it to be good? Is there life after death? I took on the question of how to live my life and what to believe in, like some somber homework assignment. As I grew older, the big questions receded. My mind would wander off before I could get anywhere near them. In my work, I tended to stick with the smaller questions and look for larger meanings in the answers I found. Of Margaret Marcus's life, I might have asked, how did she come to reject America and all it stood for? Did she ever regret her decision to leave? Of the man who invited her to live in Pakistan as his daughter, I wondered, who was he and where did he come from? What did he believe in and what did he see in Margaret Marcus? Considering her books and her letters home, I wondered if the literal questions were the wrong ones or equally unanswerable whether only the big metaphysical questions were worth asking. Margaret Marcus struck me as the sort of person who wouldn't settle for less. Margaret's life went straight to the heart, too, of the heated debate over the notion of a divide between Islam and the West. Many Western scholars and diplomats, pundits and old-fashioned Orientalists, even secular-minded Muslim writers, are convinced this divide is real and irreconcilable. The fundamental problem for the West is not Islamic fundamentalism, one scholar insisted. It is Islam, a different civilization, whose people are convinced of the superiority of their culture. For Margaret, it was the West that persisted in considering itself superior, with inevitably tragic results. She also believed that the West and Islam were implacably opposed. Any compromise with the former, she wrote, equal defeat of the latter. In work spanning three decades, she took apart the writings of those trying to find common ground between the values of the God-centered Muslim universe and those of the secular and scientific West. Writing under her new name, Mariam Jamila, she encouraged readers of her books to have nothing to do with them. This kind of sophistry fails to strike the slightest response in me, she writes primly. After Copernicus, the Western astronomer saw man as a puny speck on a tiny planet revolving around a 10th rate star drifting aimlessly in a cosmic ocean, his creation perhaps only an accident or mistake. There was something enviable in this clarity of purpose, in the insistence on meaning over meaninglessness, on big questions over small ones. However, it still struck me that in the effort to claim the superior ground, both sides traded in caricatures and insights of varying subtlety. Both seem to use and abuse history, particularly histories of violence and cruelty, to further their agendas. Both wrote from Olympian heights of authority and erudition, and inevitably both shed tears over the treatment of women. Crocodile tears, Mariam Jamila sniffed. Confronted by the clashing assumptions of my morning newspaper and Mariam's books, it often seemed that the impasse between Islam and the West was truly unbridgeable. Seduced by one view at one moment, only to betray it in favor of its opposite the next, I was wary of stepping between them. My attitude towards Mariam Jamila was, initially at least, curious but distant. Thanks. Mm -hmm.